Transfert a repris. Alors, M. Chaudry, c'est vous qui menez l'interrogatoire. Uh, Chateau Le Chaudhry, lead counsel for the commission. Our witness this afternoon is Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Can I ask that the witness be sworn or affirmed? Do you wish to be sworn or affirmed for the record? Sworn, please. Do you please state your name for the record? Justin Trudeau. And do you swear that the testimony you're about to give today is the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you very much, counsel. You may proceed. Thank you. So, Prime Minister, we'll start with the uh, typical routine housekeeping. Uh, Mr. Clerk, can I ask you to pull, pull up WIT 66, please? Prime Minister, you will recall being interviewed by Commission Council on February 27th, 2024? Yes. Can you confirm that you've re reviewed the summary of that interview, that the summary is accurate, and that you adopt it as part of your evidence before the Commission? I can. Thank you. Uh, the next is WIT 67, please, Mr. Clerk. So, Mr. Prime Minister, this is the uh, summary of your in-camera examination. You'll recall having been examined in camera by Commission Council earlier this year? Yes, I do. Okay, and once again, can you confirm that you've reviewed the summary, that the summary is accurate, and that you adopt it as part of your evidence for the Commission? I can. Perfect. We can take that down now, Mr. Clerk. So I'm going to ask you to start today, Prime Minister, by asking a pretty general question, but nevertheless a fundamental one, which is, having been Prime Minister now since 2015, can you paint for the Commission a picture of the foreign interference landscape uh, over your tenure as Prime Minister? And, I, and before you answer, I'll just put two sort of precisions on that. One is that we know foreign interference comes in all shapes and sizes, but the kind of foreign interference that interests us most today at this commission is obviously foreign interference in democratic processes and electoral uh, processes and institutions. Second, um, it goes without saying, but uh, in answering this question and all questions I pose to you, please stick to information that can be safely publicly disclosed. Indeed. Um one of the things um, that we had grown concerned about uh, as a party when we were in opposition before the 2015 election was the lack of oversight by parliamentarians uh, into what was going on in our national security universe in this country. Um, example of the uh, Afghan de detainee documents where there wasn't a process whereby parliamentarians of different parties of opposition parties could examine uh, top secret material uh, was seen as a lacking that Canada had, certainly compared to our other Five Eyes partners, which is why in our 2015 campaign platform, we committed to creating uh, a National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians, whereby parliamentarians of all different parties uh, would be sworn into the highest levels of uh, clearance to be able to oversee, verify, uh, and um, ascertain that everything that our national security agencies were doing was on the one hand compliant with Canadian values, rules, and the Charter, and on the other hand, uh, doing everything necessary to keep Canadians safe. So we started in 2015 with a commitment to strengthen our national security institutions. We did that by the creation of uh, National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians. We also combined a number of um, oversight organizations into NCIRA, which is a more um, judicial uh, or uh, academic or high level uh, oversight of our national security agencies, uh, as well as you know, as we began to govern, strengthened our uh, various national security and intelligence agencies uh, and tools. Uh, one of the things I did is I changed our national security advisor to a national security and intelligence advisor because it's not just about security and obviously the work around intelligence was getting more and more complex and important and part of keeping Canadians safe. Over the course of that first mandate, um, we witnessed uh, the uh, significant 
uh, foreign interference allegations or threats during the 2016 uh, presidential election in the United States, where uh, Russia certainly through misinformation and disinformation online uh, attempted to interfere. Uh, but also, more interestingly, as a key example, in 2017, during the French presidential election, there was actually a moment in which uh, officials within the French governmental apparatus actually had to come out and tell uh, the citizens of France that a particular piece of information or news that was about to break was in fact uh, Russian disinformation and should not be uh, given any weight or heed. That got us to reflecting on whether or not Canada had a potential to intercede in an election campaign uh, if there was a, a significant threat of foreign interference impacting the ability of our elections to actually unfold in a free and fair way. Uh, so we uh, got to work on developing uh, such a mechanism here in Canada, which ended up being two mechanisms, both the site panel, the site uh, task force that allows uh, our security agencies to monitor very closely the goings on in the election, and the panel of five, uh, which is top civil servants who would have uh, the ability, if they deemed it necessary, to actually go public um, or take other actions to ensure the uh, protection of our uh, democratic institutions and electoral processes from foreign interference. Um, one of the other examples of things that we've, uh, we did during that time in 2018, uh, when Canada hosted the G7 uh, leaders meeting in Charlevoix, Quebec, um, we actually brought forward and created the G7 rapid response mechanism which was designed uh, to monitor and respond to uh, threats of misinformation and disinformation in uh, our democracies, uh, a tool that has been um, successfully used over the past years since in a number of different occasions and indeed was uh, more recently actually strengthened uh, to weigh in a little more on uh, the democracies in Eastern Europe where we're seeing significant interference by uh, uh, Russians given the, the conflict in Ukraine. Okay, thank you for that summary. Um, what I'm going to try and get at now is uh, the threats, really, to which all of this responds. So we heard from Minister Gould this morning about the, the plan to protect Canada's democracy and, and what it was really designed to, to do, that, that process. Uh, Mr. Clerk, I'm going to ask you to pull up a document, uh, CAN 019496. So, Mr. Prime Minister, this is a document actually from 2017, so before this commission's mandate per se, but it gives an idea, I think, of uh, the kind of information, or at least that was, was uh, available to you at that time, and that's what I'm going to bring out here. So, if we, this is a memo that was written to you by David Morrison, your NSIA at the time, uh, and you received it in June 2017. So, the, the top of that um, document there talks about the Chinese foreign in interference threat. And it says, the CSIS describes the PRC essentially as sophisticated, pervasive, persistent. There are other countries around, but the PRC is the big one. Mr. Clerk, if you can just scroll down a little bit more. Okay, um, scroll down, scroll down, I'll tell you when to stop. Keep going. Okay, there we go. So uh, on the third page here, you'll see Prime Minister, it talks about allies who are facing similar challenges and refers specifically to Australia in which I believe what's explained there is they, uh, in Australia it was found that agents of the Chinese government were donating millions of dollars across the political spectrum. So your NSIA is informing you of this and keep scrolling down please, Mr. Clerk, to the next page and then brings it back to Canada. Um, oh, sorry, scroll down a little bit more, please, Mr. Clerk, till the next page. PCO comments. There we go, okay, last page. 
Politicians and elected officials, in particular at the provincial, territorial, and municipal levels, are largely unaware of the PRC's and others' efforts to influence Canada's political landscape, making them more vulnerable to these attempts, either in Canada or when traveling abroad. So there's that. And then scroll down just a little bit more, Mr. Clerk, so we can see the last part of this. Um, so this is, I'm sorry, I said it was David Morrison. It's actually Daniel Jean. This is a very sensitive issue, and public efforts to raise awareness should remain general and not single out specific countries to avoid potential bilateral incidents. However, countries across the line should be reminded of appropriate conduct and risk of consequences. So, Mr. Prime Minister, I'd like you to speak to those points, if you can. First of all, the level of knowledge about foreign interference, the level of threat here, we see it coming from and the what PRC, you do about it. and also that tension between sort of exposing something about foreign interference while at the same time having to balance international relations, bilateral incidents, and the like? Um, well, first of all, it's a good example, as I spoke about the um, experiences in the United States and in France. Uh, the experience that Australia had, uh, not with Russia, but with China, is uh, another excellent example that we were very aware of at the time, uh, and highlighted the fact that there are uh, foreign state actors who are uh, interested in playing a role in, in, uh, in our democracies or in disrupting our democracies. The difference between Russia and China is a significant one in that China has a, a, a very large a diaspora of Chinese Canadians who are uh, often the first uh, targets of interference uh, efforts by uh, a foreign state, uh, by that foreign state. So we were very aware of it as a politician in Canada for um, eight years when I became Prime Minister, uh, I was certainly aware of the various ways um, officials and different countries, particularly through diasporas, uh, can take an interest in Canadian political processes. But to understand it better, one of the first things we did uh, in 2015, maybe into 2016, uh, was request a briefing from uh, our national security officials that would uh, go at some of the things we had heard, some of the things we knew or uh, understood as opposition politicians now in a position of being in government, that we wanted to understand more about the role of foreign interference in particular communities. And you know, we even wanted to know about particular individuals that we had heard things about. Uh, and understand what landscape we were actually walking into because we suddenly had access to a very sophisticated and uh, excellent national security apparatus that when one is a simple opposition politician, you don't have access to. So from the very beginning, we knew there As were things we needed to know about. Politician. Uh, and we got briefings on that, and this uh, 2017 memo is certainly a continuation of uh, that level of awareness. The issue of it being a sensitive issue uh, is, um, is quite germane, uh, and it evolves over time. Uh, back in the early days of our government, we were very much uh, looking to deepen the trade and commercial ties with China, uh, seeing it as an opportunity for exports. One of my biggest files of the day on that was trying to uh, restore the canola shipments that many uh, Western grain farmers were relying on uh, that were seeing um, irregular blockages uh, from the Chinese authorities. So that was part of our work. But even as we were doing that, we were very aware of the areas in which we needed to uh, challenge or contest China, whether it was on issues of human rights or democracy, of China uh, Uyghurs, anything. of uh, uh, protection uh, of the rights of our, uh, our diaspora communities from um, influence or intimidation. Uh, there has always been a complex approach that every government has had to take with China. Um, over the years, however, this has shifted significantly, um, as I'm sure we'll get into. Uh, the relations with China um, took yeah, a significant you... turn uh, when uh, they chose to arbitrarily detain two Canadian citizens. Uh, and for you know, close to three years, uh, we were 
um, not just um, pushing back hard against China on um, the um, arbitrary nature of those detentions and the fact that they needed to release those two Canadians, but we were extremely active around the world in mobilizing other countries to bring up uh, Canada and the plight of the two Michaels uh, during their bilateral conversations, which was something I can say um, ended up putting a significant amount of um, strain on our relationship because it was a massive irritant to China that everyone kept talking about these two Michaels even when uh, they didn't have anything to do with Canada. We heard it regularly, but that was what we would continue to do. Um, it perhaps came to the, the, the greatest sort of head in terms of um, being reminded of appropriate contact and risk dire que cela nous uh, rappelait November les contacts appropriés et les conséquences possibles uh, when I um, saw the president of China Xi Jinping I don't know what happened there the, they messed up um, the audio for a sec opening ceremonies I mentioned to him that I needed uh, China to stop um, interfering in Canadian democratic processes, because that was very much uh, something that uh, people were very concerned about that back home at that particular moment. Okay. Um, we'll move then to the, from the general landscape, which we now I think have a, a decent picture of, to some more precise questions having to do with the, this commission's terms of reference. Et uh, je vais commencer en français, monsieur, maintenant. Et on va parler d'un sujet. So now let's move on to a topic which is contained in your interview summary and your testimony. It has to do with the way that you receive information, uh, intelligence information. Now, in your interview and previous testimony, it, it was said that the written documents were not necessarily a reflection of the information you received. and. In fact, it's the verbal briefings that make up the main part of your briefings. Can you explain that to us? And can you generally explain to us the way you receive uh, the information you need? Well, first of all, any prime minister receives countless briefings, receives countless information, not only on foreign interference or national security issues, but on the economy or uh, public security issues, um, concerns shared by allies. I am constantly in receiving mode of all kinds of information from departments and advisors across government. I, of course, also follow the headlines to know what Canadians are reading about, hearing about, what they are concerned about in their daily lives. Now, all of this information is presented in different ways, but despite the fact that I receive written information, uh, weekly summaries or uh, briefs on intelligence, which are often on an FYI basis, the only sure way to make me aware of a priority issue is not simply to give me a note, which I may or may not read or may not have time it? to Why read to say it if for, I am get traveling get talk to or if notes. I'm particularly busy at that point. It is the best way to convey information to me is to receive a direct briefing from my national security advisor, an intelligence advisor, who would give me security updates, usually on several topics um, during the same session. And this would happen on a regular basis. Sometimes it's once or twice a week or even more often if necessary. Sometimes it's only three or four times a month. It all depends. But the only way to guarantee to make sure that I receive the necessary information is to give me an in-person briefing or over a secure line, if necessary, on any issue or priority issue. 
Now, you mentioned the NSIA, so the National Security and Intelligence Advisor. Is this the person you depend on the most to provide you with the information you need in this area, or do you get the information from the clerk or from both? Well, in that particular field, it is the NSIA to um, keep me fully briefed on everything I need to know and to answer any questions I might have about security or intelligence. So she is the person I turn to to get the Why answers I need. Yes. The uh, clerk often has a role to play to uh, bring priority issues to my attention. Um, it could be security or intelligence uh, issues, but it's mostly the NSIA who is mandated with um, keeping me fully briefed on security and intelligence issues. When you receive that information, I would ask you to explain to us how you respond, how you react. Can you tell us this specifically because your chief of staff, Ms. Telford, yesterday testified that she received some information or security or intelligence products with a certain degree of uh, reserve and does not necessarily take the information at face value. Sometimes the information might be erroneous. And I would like to know what you think about that based on your experience. Well, in politics, there is a principle, especially uh, for those who are giving briefing or passing along information to a minister or to the prime minister, that if you are not sure about what you are conveying, you might not want to convey it. You cannot give a minister or the prime minister uh, wrong information before they rise in the house or speak publicly. This could be very prob problematic. So when I receive information on an incident which has occurred or on any kind of concern or on a natural disaster or an issue Canadians need to deal with, well, the veracity of the information, the accuracy of the information, the, its completeness is very important. However, I would make an exception with regard to intelligence. When you receive intelligence, it's not, it hasn't always been corroborated. In legal circles, it's well known that the difference between intelligence and evidence, well, there is a distinction between those two issues. So when I receive a briefing, whether it's in writing or more frequently verbally, by uh, security officials or intelligence officials, the reliability of the information excuse me, sorry, I'm yawning. Is uh, part it and just takes so long to answer said. the question. For it's a instance, very basic answer. When I was briefed on the fact that Iran had uh, shot down a Ukrainian airline uh, on which 100 Canadians were on board, the first reports were a little more vague. However, they told me they had indications that A, B, or C. And then at the next briefing, there was a lot more information. They knew that Iranian armed forces had shot down that Ukrainian aircraft. So what I am saying is that you have to take this intelligence, you have to take this information with a certain awareness. Yeah, we get it. We think that it still needs to be confirmed or it might not be 100% accurate because it is very sensitive information. So 
that information could be very useful to uh, indicate, for instance, that Russia is about to invade Ukraine. So we take that intelligence. We receive it in a different manner than I would, for instance, take a receive a report on Canada's unemployment rate or inflation rate. So there is a certain degree, I would not say skepticism, but of critical thought that must be applied to any uh, information collected by our security and intelligence services. Um. I'm going to take you to the 2019 election now specifically. Mr. Clerk, can you pull up uh, CAN 005461, please? So, Prime Minister, this is while it's getting pulled up. Yep, there it is. Um, we know at this point in the, uh, the evidence before the Commission that uh, on September 28th, 2019, um, the site task force and CSIS gave a briefing to uh, the security cleared representative of the Liberal Party about foreign interference in the Don Valley North riding. We also know from Mr. Broadhurst that he then received that information. How did this play out from your perspective? Uh, late in September, uh, as I was coming through Ottawa, um, I believe I was on my way out uh, across the country for a, a, another stretch of campaigning. Um, I believe it was on a Sunday as I was, I was heading out after Saturday with, uh, with my family. Okay, who cares? Uh, Mr. Broadhurst um, met me at the airport uh, in a, a holding room, in a lounge uh, on the... Uh, the um, government side of the airport, government terminal in the airport, uh, to let me know of concerns that he had received from the site task force and uh, CSIS about the nomination campaign, the nomination uh, election, um, the nomination race contest in uh, Don Valley North. He shared with me um, that Intelligence Spindo. services had shared with him concerns that Chinese officials in Canada had been um, developing plans to possibly engage in interference in the nomination contest, uh, specifically uh, by mobilizing buses uh, filled with, and I'm, uh, it, the challenge in this is always trying to pick out what I heard exactly then from what I knew later, but I believe it was either buses full of students or buses filled with Chinese speakers or Chinese diaspora members who would be mobilized uh, to support Han Dong, uh, who would have been mobilized to support Han Dong uh, in that nomination uh, contest of a few weeks previous uh, in what ended up being probably a 20 minute to half hour conversation with Mr. Broadhurst. I asked him uh, more specifically about, um, okay, so they had plans or an intent or a capacity to do this. Do we know that they did? Did you hear from CSIS and, and the security agencies that this was actually done? Um, he. They weren't entirely certain. There was reasons to believe that perhaps it has, and perhaps there were. The indication was that there were buses uh, filled with Chinese speakers uh, at that nomination contest. Um, I asked if, and, and as a matter of course, those who are in uh, politics and certainly uh, on the ground riding politics know that it is regular for buses to be mobilized in particular in contested nominations of community organizations, uh, uh, student groups, uh, yeah, you know, particular ones that are seniors all residents with Chinese could students. Yeah, bring a, a mini bus full of seniors to participate in, in a nomination contest. So just the existence of buses wasn't enough, buses with uh, Chinese speakers or Mandarin speakers in them wasn't enough to 
um, be itself uh, alarming or, or a, 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 a condemnation, but it was there were clear indications that there were concerns by CSIS that China might have been behind this um, and that those students or those individuals on the bus might have been motivated uh, or brought, mobilized to vote in that way, and these, there were concerns that CSIS had. I asked um, the extent to which they were certain that it happened, the extent to which they were certain that China was indeed behind the mobilizing of the bus or buses. And I also asked uh, whether or not CSIS had information that Han Dong knew about this, whether he was a witting and aware that China had mobilized, or Chinese officials had mobilized buses for him or not. And the answers, answers were not clear from CSIS at that point, uh, according to what Mr. Broadhurst told me. I then uh, asked, I also asked if, um, if it was a close nomination, if there was a sense that the actual result of the nomination uh, could have been affected by this bus or buses or what was there, and that wasn't clear at all. CSIS didn't have any conclusions to share at that point. Um, they don't have poll numbers? I what? asked Mr. Broadhurst uh, whether CSIS was making any uh, recommendations or uh, suggestions as to what we should do with this information. And it was clear um, to Mr. Broadhurst that this was very much about just letting us know so that we know and could perhaps um, take any actions that we deemed um, appropriate, but they weren't going to be recommending for us to take action of one way or another. But they also specified uh, that um, this was uh, secret information that we could not share with the candidate in question, Mr. Dong, uh, or the public at large uh, in terms of, of what they were telling us about these concerns and this alleg these allegations. I then asked Mr. Broadhurst um, what that. the Liberal Party processes that are in place to oversee nominations, particularly contested nominations, had flagged around that nomination contest of a few weeks before. Um, there are party officials that oversee uh, the voting, the registrations, the voting, the processes, the counting. There are lawyers in place overseeing the count. Uh, there are possibilities for the losing contestant or contestants to challenge uh, the result if they feel it was unfair. There are many processes because um, political parties often have some very uh, complex uh, fights around nomination uh, parties, all uh, nomination contests, all political parties are like that. Um, and Mr. Broadhurst uh, assured me that they had looked into when they heard uh, these allegations or this information from CSIS uh, and CITE and had no flags on the nomination process. Um, so then I had uh, a, what was a brief conversation with Mr. Broadhurst uh, after we had established all that um, to sort of agree that the threshold for overturning a democratic event like an official party nomination to find out who would be the candidate for a general election, um, particularly during an election, general election, um, must have a fairly high threshold for removal of that candidate. And that was really sort of the binary choice uh, we were placed with in that situation. Acting would be removing Han Dong as our official candidate. Um, right, and you don't want to lose votes The in other the choice would be not to remove that candidate. But even not having removed that candidate, it would be something, given this information, that we would have to revisit. Certainly, in the case that that candidate got elected, there would be questions we would have to follow up on um, after the election to properly understand what, uh, what happened and what, what the issues or the risks were in this situation. 
But understanding that the decision to ask another question. Um, remove someone needed a high threshold, a threshold that, incidentally, I have um, met and seen many other cases. As Liberal Party leader, I have that you've uh, met on the many, threshold many different occasions that you need uh, to be tossed out. Uh, ask people to step down or step away or desist as candidates for the Liberal Party. As most recently as the last election where we did that in the, in the case of uh, a downtown Toronto riding. Um, but in this case, I didn't feel that there was sufficient or sufficiently credible information that, that would justify this um, very significant step as to um, remove a candidate uh, in these circumstances. So where does that leave you? So you don't exercise that option, and you put it as a pretty binary choice there. But you have this information, you receive this information, it's, as you say, classified information that you can't share. What are you able to do? Where does this leave a political party receiving this information? Um, well, it meant that after the election, when we were out of caretaker period where I went back to being primarily prime minister and not um, simply leader of a political party with uh, 338 candidates across the country, um, I was able to turn to our um, intelligence agencies and say, uh, we need to know, know more about this. Uh, we need to understand what the context is because the answers that we get on that will have a bearing on choices we could make in the future about uh, different uh, roles or responsibilities for a, an individual in a, uh, such a situation. Okay. Um, I'm going to move on to some other things now because we have a lot to cover in 75 minutes. Je vois le temps qui coule. Um, okay, so the next topic then, uh, Mr. Clerk, you can pull this up, CAN 003116, but Prime Minister, I think I can ask you this question without reference to a document. An incident that was reported by the RRM in the 29 election had to do with an article um, published in the Buffalo Chronicle, some misinformation, false information about you specifically. Is that something that came to your attention in the 2019 election? Uh, no, it did not. No, it did not. Okay. Sorry, the, the engagement of the uh, site task force or the panel or anyone into that issue was not something I was aware of at the time. I was, of course, uh, aware of uh, the um, quite disgusting um, false uh, conspiracies or, or allegations uh, being shared by both the Buffalo Chronicle and a significant number of uh, conservative politicians. Okay, so you were aware of the article, but not how, let's say, the, the apparatus was dealing with it. I, I, I may have been aware of the oh, article. Fuck. I was, was certainly aware of the allegations and the accusations that were heinous and untrue in, uh, in that. Okay. Um, I think that's probably what we'll cover for 2019, although I do want to pull up. Uh, can 015487, please? So, Prime Minister, this is the memo from David Morrison. I, miss, I misspoke earlier. Uh, this is January 14th, 2020, I think, when you received this. And it's essentially a report on the 2019 election, not on the outcome of the election, but on the operation of the, the site task force and the panel. Mr. Clerk, can you scroll down to the third bullet, please? Actually, could I just quickly look at the box? Yeah, sorry. sorry. Yeah, the, the third bullet, yes. That's fine. Okay, so what they say here is pre-election intel briefings and monitoring provided a baseline assessment, uh, suggesting that foreign interference would be commensurate to overall interference campaigns. While some in instances were noted and some TRMs, TRM as a threat reduction measure, were taken, none of these activities met the threshold. And then, Mr. Clerk, can you keep scrolling down? Next page. Keep going, I'll tell you when to stop. Nope, I think we may, oh no, there we go, okay. Um, it says, as it pertains to FI and as referenced above, 
despite concerns that Canada would be targeted, and then I'm going to go through this quite quickly, but there, the assessment is there was no foreign cyber threat activity targeting Elections Canada, no instances of foreign interference in the human space, no significant indications of SI in the digital information ecosystem, and then what Mr. Morrison says is arguably this places the level of FI and GE 2019 below the anticipated baseline. Um, is that consistent with the information that was being provided to you about what happened in GE 2019? Uh, yes. Uh, this, this was a, a report in January of, of 2020, so three months uh, after the election. Um, I would have already have been briefed multiple times by the clerk and by others uh, that their conclusion was that the elections in 2019 were indeed free and fair and uh, the outcome was uh, not affected by foreign interference just either about Hong Dong's overall writing being or in, uh, in the specific writing contests. Okay, um, so now let's leave 2019 and move to the 2021 election. I'm going to ask you about a series of some incidents uh, or events that about which the Commission has received information. And I'll do the first one with reference to one of the topical summaries that's been produced at the Commission by the government. So, Mr. Clerk, that's Ken Sum 4. The title of this one is a bit of a tongue twister, but Possible People's Republic of China Foreign Interference Related Mis- or Disinformation. Yeah, so that's, what that's we have a lot here, going on there. If you can scroll down past the caveat page, Mr. Clerk, is a summary of uh, yeah, essentially O'Toole. allegations of misinformation about the Conservative Party, its leader, Aaron O'Toole, um, and I think Kenny Chu is in there as well that were circulating during the 2021 election. So my question to you, Prime Minister, is is this something that you were aware of as it was occurring in 2021? Uh, during the 2021 election, no. Shortly after the 2021 election, when the Conservative Party uh, went public with its concerns in the sort of the week that followed, I learned about it through media reports. Okay. Um, and were you aware that the Conservative Party had raised those concerns with the government as well? Not at the time, but later I would learn that through, uh, through briefings. Okay. Months later. The next one then is... Um, such, such a lie. Can some 13, please, Mr. Clerk? The Conservative Party is literally talking about it, and they're talking about it in the House, and you're in the House, but you didn't know till months later? So this is sure actually do. a summary about both 2019 and 2021, the more germane one, maybe 2021. Can you scroll down to the uh, information page? Thank you, Mr. Clerk. So what this summarizes, you'll see, is expressions of partisan preferences by certain PRC officials in Canada. And what it says about 2019 uh, is that there was reporting that some PRC officials expressed political preferences, which were party agnostic and opportunist at a writing level. So then scrolling down, please, again, Mr. Clerk, in 2021, there was reporting that some individual PRC officials in Canada made comments expressing a preference for a Liberal Party minority government. The rationale was they don't perceive any of the political parties as being particularly pro-China, but perceived minority governments as being more limited in terms of acting, enacting anti-China policies. Hmm. So this reporting of an expressed preference by certain PRC officials for a liberal minority, was that something of which you were aware at the time? No. Um, as I said, both the 2019 and 2021 elections happen in a context of uh, significant tensions between our government and the government of the People's Republic of China, uh, particularly over the uh, illegal and arbitrary detention of two Canadian citizens, the two Michaels. Um, we were extremely active uh, both in pushing back at uh, Chinese officials uh, on this issue, uh, but also, as I said, active around the world in uh, drumming up support uh, for people for the two, uh, for different countries for the two Michaels, but also support for an initiative we were taking around uh, arbitrary detention 
uh, and how it shouldn't be used as a tool of uh, political, uh, political pressure uh, or achieving political goals. Uh, so you know, I can certainly say uh, that while uh, individual officials may well have expressed a preference or another, the uh, impression we got and consistently would get is that the actual People's Republic of China um, would have no It just would seem very improbable uh, that that the Chinese government itself would have a preference in an, in the election. So I take it from this that whatever intelligence reporting there was on that, it did not reach your ears. No. Okay. Um, thanks. You can take that down now, Mr. And there's also a, 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 the issue of the difference between foreign interference and. Um, attempts by different countries to influence behavior. Um, diplomats around the world are in their roles to try and influence uh, favorable behaviors by the countries in which they're serving towards the country they represent. That is a big part of the role of, uh, of a diplomat, of a foreign official, uh, of all types. Canadians certainly uh, take uh, take an active role in furthering our interests, including uh, from time to time uh, having certain preferences around what might happen or might, might be an outcome of an election or a particular uh, domestic debate in, in a foreign country. However, um, foreign interference uh, happens when there is and there's a full well, proper definition of it somewhere, but my understanding so is uh, where it's um, covert, where it's uh, coercive, uh, where it is um, using uh, pressure or, or particularly um, untoward means other than having a um, diplomat express, yeah, I really hope you should sign this trade deal, it'd be good for our, both of our countries. Uh, as opposed to trying to strong arm people behind the scenes to get them to sign said trade deal or whatever one might examine. So for a diplomat to express a preference, whether it be personal or tactical or what have you, um, is not in itself foreign interference. Uh, it may be attempts at influence. It may not be anything other than the regular concept of, of diplomacy. So it would be the actions they take to further their preference that would constitute potentially foreign interference. And, and certainly in the case of China, we have seen regularly that, that many examples of this commission that there are clear actions that would uh, amount to or, or indicate uh, a willingness to engage in foreign interference. Okay. Um, the, the next incident, uh, I want to bring you to is CAN 001082, Mr. Clerk. This is another briefing, Prime Minister, that was given to the cleared representative of the Liberal Party at the time. It's the 2021 election this time. Uh, you, you probably, judging from that document, can't say very much about this, but. Yeah, it's mostly um, redacted. What I'm interested in knowing here is the timing of how this one played out, again, from your perspective. So we know that. The briefing it was actually on the 12th of September, I believe, not the 11th, as this document indicates. But it, it was given again to the Liberal Party representative and then to Mr. Broadhurst. And we've heard Mr. Broadhurst's evidence on it. So now we'd like yours. Um, my understanding is, which I learned uh, after the election was over, was that Mr. Broadhurst made the determination that it wasn't something that he needed to bring to my attention as leader of the Liberal Party, and he did not. He did not bring it to your attention? He did not bring it to my attention. During the election? During the election, yes. After the election? Uh, he did not, uh, or he probably did, but I actually got uh, more official briefings on, on this matter after the election. Okay, I understand. Okay. He, he was he was the vehicle for briefing me theoretically during the election, not officials, because that's the way it would flow through as party leader in my party leader role. Um, but afterwards, once I was once again 
uh, fully prime minister, it was officials who would be able to brief me on this. Okay. Um, speaking of briefings, we're going to turn to that topic now. So I'm going to go through a few briefings that we know uh, you, or we think you received, we do know you, that you received in many instances, on foreign interference over the relevant time period. I'll start with um, February 9th, 2021. This one I don't really have a document to point you to, so I'm just going to ask you for your recollection of it. So this would be, again, February 20, February 9th, I'm sorry, 2021. Do you recall receiving in, a briefing on that He knew in 2020. Uh, yes, uh, that was uh, a briefing uh, that I got on uh, on the phone. I was not uh, not in person for that briefing. I was there via uh, teleconference on on a secure phone. And uh, yes, I got a briefing. Okay. Do you recall the content of that briefing at all? It was a, as I recall, a a, a general briefing on a number of uh, issues, including foreign interference. Okay. The next one then in time skips to the fall of 2022. Mr. Clerk, can you pull up CAN 015842, please? Oh, I need a coffee. Excuse me, sorry. Okay, this document, which has been talked about quite a bit in these proceedings, is briefing notes to the director of CSIS. And Mr. Clerk, again, can you scroll down just so the Prime Minister can see a bit of the document and its content? So, Prime Minister, my first question is, you, you, do you remember getting this briefing in the fall of 2022, October 27th? Yes, my memory is always better when, I'm, when I was physically in the place where I got the briefing. So, I, uh, I remember very clearly this briefing. Um, this briefing was actually an overview of a number of different uh, cases and situations, uh, none of which uh, had to do with federal elections. Okay, so would you say that the content of this particular, these notes, these briefing notes, accurately conveys what you were told during uh, that briefing? Not particularly. Um, obviously, uh, there are elements uh, in this that are um, consistent with the briefing that was uh, on different elements of foreign interference. Uh, but. <laughs> when it comes to briefings, uh, and others uh, can speak to this and how they make decisions about what to read from their prepared notes during an actual briefing uh, with, uh, with uh, ministers or, or a prime minister. Um, but it is much more of a... Dude, spit it out. Holy crap. A conversation than someone reading a prepared text to what? Uh, to to uh, the minister. It took you that, that long briefing. to say that? Um, yeah, there are elements in here that say, for example, in the, having read the briefing note uh, in preparation for this, uh, uh, this inquiry, um, that talk about how serious foreign, uh, foreign interference is and how uh, we need to do more. That wouldn't have been something that uh, the CSIS director or the national security advisors or whoever would have had to spend much time on because they would have known that we did understand how serious foreign interference is and how much we take it seriously. And actually, that was why we would spend more time on specific cases or concerns that were really the meat of the briefing. So um, while notes are prepared for the briefer is what actually becomes the most important thing that I certainly recall about those briefings was the various and specific cases we went through and how they are examples of concern or not concern that we then have to behave in certain ways or have follow-ups on this or that. I mean, it is much less a large theoretical briefing and much more concrete this is a situation, and then the discussion about how we deal with this 
particular situation or example or another would be where the the larger theoretical discussion and implications would come in, but they would be concentrated around specific uh, individuals or cases. Okay, so maybe we'll pull up now uh, Ms. Telsford's notes from that meeting. So that's CAN 009803. A little more sparse than Brian Klaus would be, but at least we have a few points here. Um, do these <laughs> notes help shed any light on, on what was dealt with in that briefing for you, Prime Minister? Do these seem familiar? Um, yes, I think the, the one, two, three uh, indicates that different uh, uh, examples that we were, or the ex situations, or, or actually there are cases uh, that we were talking about, or individuals we were talking about. Um, and the bragging is not doing uh, definitely um, definitely uh, helps me recall uh, a part of the conversation where there was, and let me be careful how I say this so it's not identifiable, uh, there was a foreign government official based in Canada who was taking credit um, for a certain thing having happened in Canada um, in their reporting to a superior or to, to their home country. Uh, and just the fact that a foreign official was taking credit for having um, delivered a particular outcome in no way meant that anything that particular official did actually created the outcome. Bragging is not doing. Uh, so, you know, one can imagine a diplomat in a far off land, uh, you know, wanting to write back home to say, see, look, look what I did, aren't I good? Uh, we got the outcome we wanted, perhaps. Um, when that individual may not have had any actual bearing on the outcome of um, the particular event. Okay. I don't know if that's sufficiently clear for what it was. It, it is. And thank you. Um, the last document maybe on this point, uh, 4097. Seven nine four zero seven nine. Sorry. Seven, nine, four, zero, seven, no, sorry. Four zero seven nine. My bad. There we go. Okay, so again, these are notes from that day. So if you can have a quick look at these, Prime Minister. The non-redacted parts of these. Everything's just redacted. And what you'll see there is a text box over information that's been redacted but summarized by the Commission. Does this seem familiar as information that was discussed at that meeting? During that same October uh, October meeting? Sorry, what was that? The yes, yes, that's October, the October 27th. meeting. Um, I couldn't really speak to it. There's uh, too many redactions on a document that I, I would never have seen. Fair enough. Okay, uh, next one then is November 30th, 2022. Can we pull up, please, Mr. Clerk, CAN 014285? So this is a memo to you, Prime Minister, of November 30th, 2022. And Mr. Clerk, again, if you can scroll down so the Prime Minister can see the document, pass the transmittal note. It's 
a memorandum for you by the NSIA copy to the clerk claims of foreign interference in the 2019 general election for information. And the context of this prime minister is this is shortly after their, the media leaks have started about foreign interference. So a memo was written and we can again scroll through a bit to, to see the content of that memo. You could just keep going a little faster than that. I'm not really gonna stop on anything. But I will ask you now that you've seen it a little bit to just scroll back up to the summary part, Mr. Clerk. Okay, there we go. PCO searched its holdings. So what's happening here is uh, the NSIA and PCO are, are trying to figure out what you were briefed on and when. And so there's a paragraph here. PCO searched its holdings, engaged the security and intelligence partners to identify instances when briefings on suspected FI in the 2019 general election were provided. A, that identified a single PCO information note dated January 14th, 2020 which is the one that we've seen earlier, and then it references the February 9th, 2021 uh, briefing. Is that consistent with your recollection of when you were briefed on these issues? Um, sorry, yes. Is, is, this note of uh, November 30th, 2022, was when we were uh, asking, okay, there have been all these leaks on you know what uh, may have happened during the 2011 uh, 2019 election uh, and uh, we were asking you know were these things we got briefed on uh, were these things that we were flagged at that time uh, and yes that's that's the single pco information note dated to january uh, 24th 2020 um, and then the February 9th, 2021 briefing. So well, all I'm asking is whether that's consistent with your recollection yes. of when you were briefed on these issues. You were briefed in 2020. I, I wasn't, I, th th these were uh, requests. I was, I was made, a, I made a request to our national security and intelligence advisor because there were things being alleged in the leaks that we had it clearly not says been briefed right here, on. So I'm not you were entirely briefed. certain about the, briefing dates there uh, given because there were things, including those 11 candidates uh, as, as, as a quote, uh, that we had never been briefed on until we saw them in the, in the papers because following the leaks. Right, so I guess my, maybe my question wasn't clear. Um, the content of this particular document, I'm not asking you about, except just to confirm that this is consistent with your recollection of when you were briefed, the January 2020 and the February 2021. January 2020. Was the memo that we looked at earlier. We've already looked at the memo. Sorry, you confirmed. That was, a, that was a David Morrison memo? Right. I never read the David Morrison memo to my recollection. I got briefed on the contents, which was basically that um, foreign interference was uh, lower than expected and the elections were free and fair in 2019. Such Those bullshit. were the that top level conclusions that I was briefed on within days or weeks of the end of the 2019 nope. election. By the time we got around to January, um, it was good to have that report. I ended up reading the, uh, the, the Judd report, I believe, was the um, no. uh, full assessment of the work that Sight and the panel did uh, during the 2019 election, but I did not read that. Uh, I did not receive that January 24th uh, note because I'd already been briefed on its entire contents. It just okay. says so, they're reminding uh, you that you were briefed. Katie Telford even said that anytime you're given stuff, you read all of it 100%. You spend a lot of time reading your briefs. Yes. I guess that Katie goes back says to your you point about briefs. oral briefings or what really get to you, not necessarily the written ones. Okay, um, can we then pull it's up Mr. Clerk, bullshit. CAN 017673? 110%. And, and, and let me just, I mean, I wouldn't want to give people 
the impression that 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 you're lying um, briefings weren't something particularly uh, intelligence briefings we took very very seriously but that's because you read it in most of these secure briefings which would go into a a skiff a secure compartmentalized room um where we would be um told we were told to leave our phones outside, take off our watches and our Fitbits, make sure we're totally secure within a Faraday cage. Uh, and uh, then we um, receive the briefings, often being told, no, we can't keep any of the documents that are given. We can read the documents that are given, but we then need to return them to the, uh, to the, uh, uh, the officials. Um, certainly in the beginning, uh, we were never clear on whether we could take notes on this either because security was important, fortunately, as we've all seen through various inquiries. It's a good thing Brian Cloud does take notes. Um, but you know, th there was always a, a sense that um, there was lots of written material and lots of tracking of that information as a government must and taking very seriously all these things in very careful controls. But when it came to uh, briefing and taking actions and understanding the context, it happened through uh, secure briefings and conversations that were uh, primarily um, us receiving information, us asking questions, us um, directing um, further actions or research in this area or that area that they would then take away and do. I wouldn't want anyone to think that, oh, because the briefings were primarily oral or, for example, that... Yeah, if uh, they were oral, uh, you still would have been given the paperwork. Memo, uh, I didn't read um, because it wasn't delivered to me because I got the content in uh, other conversations with my NSIA, with my, uh, with my clerk about the fact that the yeah, election if it's was... Yeah, completely... Integrity uh, was, uh, was upheld. Okay. Um, we'll just go to some other notes then. I think, I believe these are Brian Klaus notes from November 30th, 2022. Uh, do you recall this briefing or this meeting, Prime Minister? Um, my notes indicate that this was uh, immediately before question period, a briefing uh, that happened over lunch hour as I was preparing to go in to uh, deal with uh, some, some fairly um, intense uh, questioning on the issue of foreign interference, given the explosive nature of the uh, media uh, stories uh, stemming from uh, unsubstantiated and uncorroborated intelligence shared by uh, a leaker. Um, so these were, you know, th these were conversations around what I could say and what uh, uh, what uh, we uh, we could and couldn't say uh, around uh, around some of these allegations that were in the paper, uh, but would leave us limited on what we could actually rebut, regardless of the fact that there was, uh, there were inconsistencies, there were uncorroborated information in the leaks. Uh, there were also things that were flat out wrong, but um, yeah, I right. was reminded of, of the, um, the old story of uh, uh, some FBI uh, agent questioning a, a, a witness in an organized crime situation and saying, well, did you meet with that mobster in LA? The guy says, I can't comment. Did you meet with that mobster in Detroit? I can't comment. Did you meet with that lob mobster in Miami? No, I definitely did not. Um, you know, the, sometimes in denying something, you're giving information you couldn't. And, and throughout, uh, my preoccupation and why these leaks were of such deep concern um, was that we couldn't actually correct the record without, in some cases, confirming the tradecraft and the work that uh, women and men in our security agencies and sources relied upon by our security agencies to keep Canadians and our institutions safe without putting them at risk. Uh, without sharing with um, adversaries some of the information or the methods uh, that we use uh, to keep Canadians safe. And that's part of the reason for the um, 
complex nature of a public uh, inquiry into issues of foreign interference, that if we say certain things or if we contradict or deny other things, we could be giving our adversaries tools uh, to actually uh, understand how we go about detecting their um, interference or, or uh, um, illicit ways of engaging to harm Canadians. Well, the ways it's you're going about problem. it isn't working, so. Um, so the next, uh, I'm going to keep going with the briefings and the, the post-leak world briefings specifically, Prime Minister. Please Not stick long on the, left, but uh, please stick on the 2022 date. One eight zero zero nine, please. He was briefed in 2020. He read the brief and then he held an election in 2021, knowing that the 2019 election was compromised. So these are notes from the date on the notes is March 19th, but we know it was actually March 20th. So this is March 20th, 2023 a meeting at which you were present and uh, I believe your staff was present and a number of senior national security uh, officials. So if we scroll down, so again, Mr. Prime Minister, you can see the, the uh, content of this document or the unredacted content. Are you able to tell us your recollection of what was happening at this meeting based on these notes? Yes, I remember this meeting well. If you actually scroll back up, please, Mr. Clerk, uh, to, uh, yeah, a little higher. So we get both, there, right there is fine. Um, PM, that's me. Uh, speaking of nominations, we were talking about, thank you. For, uh, uh, we were talking about nominations in there, and I don't remember what the, what the next, who the next speaker was that's redacted, uh, but, um, the emphasis on charter rights, uh, or the bringing up of charter rights, and further down, uh, PM, no June 2019 uh, meeting. Um, those are two examples of us uh, working constructively with um, CSIS and, and the intelligence agencies to um, to better understand and validate certain pieces of information. Um, for example, um, in the information we were seeing, we'd seen that CSIS had a source uh, that said that there was a um, June 2019 meeting that I was at um, that I can clearly and unequivocally at the time and since then confirm uh, never happened. I did not have the meeting that the source had set. Now, this doesn't mean that CSIS got it wrong. It meant that CSIS was now able to validate that what their source had said in this situation was wrong. And therefore, that puts a particular understanding or color on their ability to interpret other statements of fact or supposed fact that that source made. And that's part of how intelligence work happens. When, when you know for sure, when a source says something that you can verify is true, that makes them more reliable. When a source yeah, says we, something we don't that need you, you can to verify that. was wrong, um, that also gives you more information about that source. So it was important for us to highlight, for example, in that meeting that there was no, uh, no meeting, that uh, meeting as happened. was described by that source. Uh, similarly, on the question of charter rights, that was a slightly different tweak where in the uh, CSIS analysis, uh, the analyst had highlighted that there was uh, possible violations of people's charter rights in a particular situation. Uh, and we had asked and pressed for uh, more sort of legal or judicial analysis of that assertion within because it didn't quite ring um, true to our instincts as political actors in terms of the analysis that CSOS was making. Again, it's part of the process that one goes through as you engage with um, the experts in foreign intelligence and, and uh, security uh, in an active way to try and make sure we're understanding, getting the accurate picture and, and able to then continue to keep both Canadians and our institutions safe through the various jobs we do. Okay. Madame la Commissaire, I think I'm out of time. Mais vous me permettez une dernière question? Certainement. Parfait. Um, Mr. Prime Minister, I'm going to sort of ask you. 
conclude this. May I have a last question, Madam Commissioner? Yes. So we've heard about the existence of foreign interference, the pervasiveness of the threat, and various measures that, as you said, have been put in place to combat this. Um, you may know that earlier in these proceedings, we heard from a number of individuals who found themselves sort of in the, the receiving end, the being targeted by potential foreign interference in some ways. And there have been calls for the government to do more uh, than it's done already to, do, to address this and to protect Canadians. And in particular, I'm gonna take you, I'll just read you a small excerpt of um, the former MP Kenny Chu when he was testifying here. He said, uh, that experiencing what he'd gone through in terms of the potential PRC misinformation, well, we don't know PRC, but potentially PRC-related misinformation, disinformation, potential foreign interference, he said, uh, it's almost like I was drowning and they were watching. And the best they could do, by the way, is to let me know that I'm drowning. I don't need their notification. I need their help. Mm -hmm. So, Prime Minister, I'd like to hear the, your response to that. And... Um, essentially, maybe in, in providing this response, help set the stage for the second phase of the Commission's work? Um, starting by perhaps taking a bit of a step back uh, and the idea that you know, we need to do more, I agree. Um, when, when we took office in 2015, there was very little, if any, uh, mechanisms to counter foreign interference. Yes, our intelligence agencies. Dude, eight years uh, later, you're still blaming work, Harper. The idea or the priority of protecting our democracy, um, particularly when it comes to misinformation, disinformation, uh, active engagement uh, in various um, diaspora communities or or uh, electoral events. Um, was not on the radar uh, at all uh, when we took office. Um, it hadn't been something that the previous government or any previous government had done much on at all. So we started from a standing start. Um, we created the National Security Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians. Uh, we created NSIRA. Um, we moved forward to the rapid response mechanism and we've continued uh, to do more. Yes, the panel for the 2019 and 2021 elections site, uh, but we've continued to continue to do more. Uh, the, you continued to uh, continue. We recently brought You're in genius. a National wow. Security Committee, National Security Council uh, of Cabinet uh, to address sort of strategic threats on a larger level. We're continuing to give more tools and powers and learning from You're continuing uh, what to continue. the P5 was able to do oh, in, in on. 2019 and 2021 that they'll be able to apply uh, in, uh, in the 2025 uh, election when it's uh, likely to come. There is always more to do. And one of the things I'm very much looking forward to um, coming from the work uh, this, uh, uh, this commission is doing is to make recommendations on how uh, we can strengthen even further the uh, protection of institutions and of our democracy. But that's only half of it. The other half is giving Canadians confidence in their institutions, in their democracy. Uh, and whether it's a, a diaspora member um, worried about stepping up to running for uh, elected office in this country because they're worried about the impact that might be real or perceived from uh, a country they chose to left, leave many years ago for whatever reasons, um, there are real concerns and feelings involved. And ultimately, democracy only works when people are when you're out of it. Confident in its ability to keep them safe, but also be the articulation of what they want for their community and their country. That's where confidence in the integrity of the elections in 2019, 2021 is so important and something that we have emphasized throughout this process that the every briefing I've ever got from all my intelligence and uh, security experts is that those elections were indeed free and fair and nothing we have seen and heard despite, yes, attempts by 
uh, foreign states to interfere, those elections held in their integrity were decided by Canadians. But the feeling that individuals can have that maybe our institutions aren't so strong, maybe they are impacted by oh, foreign okay. actors who wish to do ill to Canada and to Canadians. He just loves um, to hear himself is talk. something that we need to be very, very thoughtful about. And one of the ways ultimately to keep ensuring that our democracy is safe is to make sure that citizens themselves are engaged, active, critical thinkers who are empowered to see what is information, what is misinformation or disinformation and um, be robust in their right to choose whatever direction they want for the country. And we've seen with the intensity of misinformation and disinformation, not just from foreign actors, but just on social media generally in many pockets, that um, it's not automatic. Democracy requires constant vigilance and constant hard work. It didn't happen by accident, it doesn't continue without effort. It's not just effort of commissioners and politicians and spooks. It's efforts of every single individual to feel like they have the full ability to engage in our democratic processes and to feel that they are safe and protected as they engage, whether it's as a voter or a candidate or, uh, or an elected member of parliament or of, of provincial parliament or, or wherever. These are things that we all need to continue to work together on. And I, I am in constant awe of uh, everyone across this country who continues to put up their hand and step forward in a time where it's getting more and more difficult uh, and more and more challenging to be part of public and political discourse, to say, no, I want to build my country for the better. I want to contribute to my community, and I'm going to step forward into a place where I'm going to take slings and arrows, particularly um, members of diaspora communities. But bringing in that diversity of Canadians' experiences is the only way to make sure that we're actually building the kind of country we need to be for the future. So I. I salute uh, everyone who steps up and will continue to commit myself to Holy making crap, sure that those feelings of... He says, one sec, I just want to say something, and then he talks for seven minutes. ...confidence and of safety and as we talking. involve and engage as citizens or more as our democracy um, are protected. Madam Commissaire, ce sont mes questions. Merci. I have no, no more questions. Um, as far as you know, do, do you have a mechanism or a procedure in place that will ensure that the NSIA would constantly have access and receive information relating to foreign interference? Answer. The NSIA has a role of collecting and looking for all the information available in all of our security agencies, whether it's at the defense level or whether it's at uh, foreign affairs or, or, or the or any other security agency. That is the person who is beside me to coordinate that universe. So she has the capacity and the ability to look for those answers. For example, when I woke up this morning, I saw some reports in the media. Nobody cares about what you did when you woke up this morning, Neil. I immediately consulted my NSIA to ask her, can you do a follow-up on what I'm reading this morning and come back to me with information? And I have confidence that that wasn't the question. The, universe the question was, do you have a mechanism in place that automatically shares information, not if you call and ask for information? Where information is available, she has access to that universe. She is the person towards which everything uh, uh, gathers towards. Question. So I understand that 
she has access to everything. But whether it's the agencies or the, or the departments involved, do those agencies and departments transmit information regarding foreign interference to the NSIA? Answer. I am confident that she receives the information that the agencies find relevant. But as we can see and we have seen, things can always be improved with respect to how the different departments and the different uh, levels of government work together. And the very existence of the NSIA ensures that we have a point of a connection between authority and uh, uh, gives her a capacity to collect information from everywhere. Question, when you receive in information, intelligence that is, that may not have been corroborated as of yet, but that are likely to be very important, that could have a significant impact. Could you ask the agencies by setting up a priority list to complete or to follow through with those investigations? Answers, absolutely. And often, and in almost every situation, when I say there's a follow-up on, you should follow up on this, the answer I receive is, we are doing that and this is what we're doing. Of course, the uh, work that uh, the agencies do does not need for a minister to ask for a follow-up. They will follow up on preoccupying uh, uh, situations. Yes, a government or a prime minister can uh, highlight something, can put pressure to accelerate things or send more resources, but our systems and our agencies in the area of security have the mandates and the responsibilities to follow up on uh, preoccupying situations. Question. So we could, um, you could amend things? Answer, yes. So we would have a regular reflection on our priorities with respect to security. Uh, for our country. We could lay more emphasis on cybersecurity, for example. When we see what the emphasis was 10 years ago, it's very different. The world is changing. The reality of our world is that uh, the balance of powers are changing. Russia has become extremely problematic, not just mildly problematic as was the case 10 years ago. So we adjust regularly. And elected officials have an important role to play indeed. But the work that our intelligence and security agencies play is that they work in a robust fashion in general. Question. When your campaign manager, Mr. Broders, informed you that there were allegations that some perps people were, trans were bust to go and vote for a contest, a nomination contest, did you ask for further investigation? Answer. With respect to the party, yes. I first asked, what information do we have in this regard? And I also asked if we could follow up, or at least the party should follow up with Elections Canada and identify the reports that were, see the reports that were written out, what were the conclusions, do we have additional information? Well, the reality is that in highly contested nomination situations, there are usually uh, bust uh, voters. Sometimes that will be sp uh, covered by the spending of the candidates. And in other situations, you would see buses that belong to a uh, an elder person's uh, center, and that will be used by one group or another. And in that case, you might not see receipts being submitted. In my own nomination contest that was in 
March or April 2007, there were many buses of Italians and Greeks because that was my reality in Papineau, my writing of Papineau. So that's a common uh, occurrence. And that would not be enough to flag any situation where anybody looking at the, con the nomination contest would say that, no, we have to follow up on that. We are not. So we're not a forensic organization. We know that we are limited in what we need to go and look into three weeks later. Question. If my notes are correct, you indicated that that was to be revisited after the elections. So did you revisit that after the elections? Answer, yes. Question by the party? Answer. By the party, I'm sure, yes, there were verifications made, but the verifications were comprehensive, I'm sure of that, immediately after they were notified by the site task force. I am not sure that there was extensive research that could have lasted months or weeks because we had only the information that we had and nothing more. If there were maybe an investigation by Elections Canada because of irregularities, there could have been a follow-up, but Elections Canada would be the one to speak on that. To me, the follow-up was at the level of the possible involvement of Chinese authorities here in Canada who would have actively been interested in the uh, nomination contest of a specific candidate. That is where we would have been able to do a follow-up, not necessarily to see what was the truth of what happened during the context, because it's very difficult to highlight situations there. But could we have more clarity on the the role or the potential interests that a Chinese authority may have had for a specific candidate. Commissioner says thank you.